Okay, so that was the P2E groups and over. So with uh, with you, I actually proceed, uh, I was able to get through uh, the entire ANOVA chapter. But let's like quickly go through the details of it. Okay, so you do ANOVA when you have um, one scale dependent variable, you have three or more levels of an independent categorical variable. And that's important because that's why you're essentially doing it because with uh, understanding the group differences, you would need to do multiple comparisons. Multiple com comparisons come with each comparison at a type one error of most likely 5%. If you do this uh, repeatedly, you are ending up with a very high probability of a type one error. As a recap, type one error is where you reject something that you wouldn't want to reject. Type two error is when you don't reject what you should have rejected. So again, if you have seven groups, you're ending up with 21 comparisons, which basically puts you at a 66% risk of a type one error. So uh, I'm flagging this table, keep, keep that in mind because that gives a pretty good overview. Uh, keep in mind that you are basically for the final, your main, your main goal will be to know which test to use uh, for the respective question at hand. And you will need to understand this, like what do I have at hand, what, what is given and how to approach it. So in, a, in analyzing our ability to compare the means is basically done then by a calculation of F score. The F score basically quantifies the variance between groups over the variance within groups with the idea to find out how much weight, uh, what's the ratio actually in terms of how much difference do we see caused by the group differences, the differences by the means, and how much is actually caused by the variability within the groups. And this is my favorite graph. Where is it? This is my favorite graph to basically see the difference is that these will basically uh, allow the estimation of the between group differences, the deviations from that grand mean. And the within group variability basically causes here overlaps, which in the greater scheme of things will then diminish your F score and consequently allow you to, uh, won't allow you to reject the null hypothesis. Because if there's too much overlap, your groups do not significantly differ. Uh, keep in mind the null hypothesis for uh, um, ANOVA, which is basically that all three means are identical. Whereas the research hypothesis says that at least one mean is different from one other mean. Um, yeah, the six steps are the same. Also remember how to quantify the degrees of freedom between and within. Here, basically, you're looking at degrees of freedom between, is basically the number of groups minus one, and degrees of freedom within is uh, the sum of the degrees of freedom of the respective group. Degrees of freedom can also be quantified if you have degrees of freedom total. You can also quantify it by basically calculating. Uh, all entries in all groups. So it's the total sample size minus the number of the groups gets you to the same end because you subtract the one with each group. So uh, also know how to read uh, an F score table, which will basically allow you to see um, the critical cutoff. So you basically, you have degrees of freedom in the numerator and degrees of freedom in the denominator. Degrees of freedom in the numerator are basically the degree, the number of groups minus one, as we know, and the degrees of freedom in the denominator are basically uh, those within the groups. So uh, if you have a degree of freedom of, let's say, three, and the degrees of freedom in the denominator of four, you basically can then, in the respective uh, block, find your uh, alpha, your critical value, your critical uh, value uh, that determines your critical region and allows you then to estimate um, the critical region. 
Okay. Um, good. Then we have the F score table. That will then lead to a so called source table. The source table basically shows you the, it gives you the sum of squares for uh, between and within, and then the sum of these as the sum of squares total. You have then the degrees of freedom quantified uh, in, in the third column. You have the variance in the fourth column and the respective F in the fifth column. The F being the difference between uh, the variance between by over the variance within. So then the calculations, we have done those yesterday. Know which calculations to do for which component uh, in your source table. This is gonna be uh, critical. Also you uh, have in homework too, you have exercises to that extent uh, so you can practice it through. And I highly recommend you go through each of these calculations to understand why it's calculated that way. Um, I, uh, as quick heads up, don't rely it's uh, the same homework as on the last semesters. So uh, we have now uh, the critical value, everything exceeding this critical value basically leads uh, to an prospectus F score in your critical region. Uh, as soon as it exceeds the critical cutoff, it's basically uh, to be rejected. Um, we have talked about the R square. Uh, I will just go to that additional slide that I have posted. I found it. Uh, yeah. So for some reason in the slides, uh, the alpha square is not mentioned, or the omega square is not mentioned. So we have the R square is basically the, the proportion of um, the sum of squares between as a fraction of the sum of squares total. So that's basically, it, it quantifies the proportion of variability that is accounted for to the variability between the group means. Comparably, the omega square is uh, calculated in a comparable fashion, but it basically is, um, utilizing also the degrees of freedom and the respective variance. So essentially you are, you are kind of uh, mixing in um, the information and the sample size into your estimate of that fraction, which kind of gives you more accurate estimate and kind of incorporates the information of sample size. So consequently, you basically, you get, uh, then an R square and an omega square is being uh, is essentially being compared to the same conventions. So small would be 0 0.01 to 0 0.06, medium would be 0 0.06 to 0 0.14, and large uh, large effect sizes are 0 0.14 and larger. So uh, this is a little bit in distinction to the actual F. Keep in mind, so the F is the ratio of um, between groups variance over, uh, over the within groups variance, whereas the R squared is the proportion of how much is attributed to the actual uh, vari variance between the groups. Uh, remember when to do and what post hoc tests to do. Uh, so you basically, there are two scenarios where you will do a post hoc test. Uh, one is basically when you find a significant F, that basically indicates that at least one of those groups is significant. So you, with knowing that, you basically you would get started to kind of compare these groups. The second scenario are a priori bland comparisons that basically have sparked the interest. They're part of your research question and you, want, you basically want to test these specific groups against each other. So uh, one way to hypothesis test is the Tucky on a significance difference test is a widely used post hoc test. Um, basically quantifies the honest significant difference Q 
which is um, mean one minus mean two divided by uh, the standard error of the mean, which is the square root of the variance divided by the n. And then basically compared against the so-called Q table. The Bonferroni test is now a post hoc test that provides stricter critical value for every comparison of means. What it does, the post hoc, so both Taki and uh, Bonferroni basically point in the same direction. So we basically, we are now with Bonferroni, we're adjusting our alpha. So we're basically, we're dividing that alpha level uh, by the number of comparisons, therefore derive a smaller alpha and uh, testing our derived um, F, of the resulting P to our um, Bonferroni alpha. So that's the between groups and ANOVA. So now the within groups and ANOVA is a little different. It's only slightly different. So, uh, um, the main difference is really that you're now quantifying the variability of the subject and you're removing this from your within groups variance, thereby lowering the value on your denominator, consequently allowing for a slightly greater F, because think of the equation between groups variance over within groups variance basically gets you that ratio. And that ratio basically uh, indicates whether it's, uh, whether the numerator is larger, that's one, basically a direction which it increases the F or whether the denominator is smaller, which also increases the F consequently, right? So if you decrease the denominator by taking out the subject variability, so the differences between the subjects within your groups, go through all the groups, and you're taking this information out, <coughs> you're basically you're ending up with this true within groups variance. And as a consequence, you really put the emphasis on the between groups variance. So it's basically the concept is the same as the paired sample t test. So you're using it when the same participant does multiple things, and goes through multiple conditions. And a, a synonym for it is the repeated measures ANOVA. So you basically, you have repeated measures and thereby you basically, uh, you basically um, yeah, uh, do it within groups and all. So you're using it when you have one independent variable with three different levels. Again, a scale dependent variables, and notably the same participants undergo the same levels of the independent variable. The benefits of a within groups and over, it reduces the error due to the differences between the group. So the variability will actually be unaffected, but you remove the error from uh, the calculation of the F caused by the differences between the groups. So basically you get a more accurate estimate of the group differences and the weight of these group differences in your comparison. So the groups are identically because each group includes the same participants. That also makes a lot of sense and is actually super important because now you have factors in your equation, hypothetically, that you're not accounting for. So if you have the driving conditions, experience of the driver will make a difference, right? If you have, for some reason, you don't have them randomly assigned to each driving condition, and you basically you have in one group more experienced drivers versus in the other groups you have those that are, I don't know, just recently made their driving license. That will affect your probability estimate of how likely are they to collide with another driver when merging on the highway. So re you reduce this variability due to the differences for the people in the study across the groups or within the groups, more accurate actually. So the calculations were one way within groups and over. So they are basically the same. You only get one additional sum of squares, which is the subject sum of squares. This is basically uh, calculated in addition to between groups, within groups, and total sum of squares. Uh, 
and you're removing then uh, the subtract sum of squares from the within groups sum of squares. So six steps of hypothesis testing, I, again, the same. They are, uh, you identify the population distribution of assumptions, assumptions. Yeah, we're getting there. Um, okay, state the null and research hypothesis. You determine the characteristics of the comparison distribution. You determine critical values or cutoffs. You calculate test statistics and you make a decision. So the one way within groups and over. So there's an additional assumption compared to the one way between groups and over. And this basically in addresses the order effects. So remember order effects from the yeah, example t-test, right? Uh, so that basically is a situation where the previous condition affects the following condition. And that's particularly when you have several groups, a huge problem. So let's assume the situation here where you again have your driving conditions. Let's assume these driving conditions are be basically done subsequently to each other. So you have individual one drives alone, drives on the highway, merges on the highway, no collision happens, then it goes to the next exit, goes around, comes in. So the second time, drives, no collision, goes around, comes back, merges again on the highway. But the third time, at this point, is getting like annoyed, particularly uh, so if he's talking with somebody on the video phone, says something he doesn't like, he gets angry, it gets agitated, the collision increase, increases. Then the fourth time, he basically exits, he goes around, he comes back, he merges again, he's tired, exhausted at this point, the risk is higher. That's an order effect, classic order effect, right? And so thereby you are counterbalancing now to mitigate that risk. And you're basically counterbalancing would be you have one individual start in that sequence, another individual start in that sequence. So you basically, you're, you're changing the sequences. If you would randomize this, this becomes a random uh, experiment at this point, so you basically you you're maximizing the effect of the counterbalancing and you're minimizing the potential risk of an order effect. You can also do a so-called washout period by basically doing them on four different days, and the individual goes on the highway and then drives home and comes back the next day. So that would be a washout period. That's that's the cleanest of all things. Good. Um, Right. Okay. So that's the within groups. So just like the between groups and over, it uses the F distribution as the comparison distribution. Null and research hypothesis is again the same as with the between groups and over. We have mean one, two, and three. They're always three identical. Whereas the, the research hypothesis is that at least one of these means is different from another mean. That is your definition. Uh, degrees of freedom, they're a little bit trickier to quantify now because you need to factor in a couple of additional factors. Okay, so you have degrees of freedom between, that's easy, right? So you have a certain number of groups and you're subtracting one. So that's simple. Degrees of freedom subject, uh, please note here that the lowercase n differs from an uppercase n where the lowercase m basically indicates the number of individuals in that group. So that's the number of subjects, whereas, um, whereas the, the capital case n indicates the total number of uh, subjects and the different conditions. So if they're going through four different conditions, five people go through four different conditions, it's 20 capital case ends, but it's only five lowercase ends. So one is the, uh, the subject number, the other one are the actual sample size. So the degree of freedom uh, for subjects is n minus one. So that's, if it's five guys, it's five minus one. So that's four. Degrees of freedom within is degrees of freedom between multiplied by degrees of freedom of subjects. Uh, because you essentially are multiplying the degrees of freedom of your groups with degrees of freedom of the subject. That's the degrees of freedom within. And the degrees of freedom total is your 
total sample size minus one. Or alternatively, the sum of these three comes to the same thing. Good. Um, that's all about the degrees of freedom. And we're going to do this now with our example. Today's example, not this, today's example uh, brings us to B. So in the Bender sample D test we did with wine, now we're going to be uh, tasting B. So we have five participants that uh, taste three different kinds of beer. Cheap beer, mid-range beer, and high-end beer. And they are asked to give a rating to these beers. So we see already quite some differences here, right? So the high-end beer seems to be somewhat higher. Uh, so, but nevertheless, okay, so let's do degrees of freedom between. So step one, would be, uh, okay, so. Okay, so three groups, three beers, five participants. And, well, counterbalanced because there is quite certain an order effect. Uh, so step two, step two, we have, uh, quantification of the null hypothesis. So that's M1 was M2 or equals M2 equals M3. So alternative hypothesis, at least one differs from another. Step three. Step three is now the quantification of the degrees of freedom. So degree of freedom between is now uh, three groups, minus one, that's two. Degree of freedom within, no, degree of freedom subject first, is five minus one, so that's four. Degree of freedom uh, within is now four multiplied by two, so that's eight. And degree of freedom total is now the sum of all these, or n minus one. So it's either it's five multiplied by three minus one, that is 14, or it's the sum of these three which is what surprise all the 14. Good. So that's characterizing our comparison distribution. So we know now what we are basically looking at. If we're going now into our F score table, we can in the F score table find now our respective value, our critical values. So we have degrees of freedom uh, between, we have three groups, three minus one, that's two. We have um, degrees of freedom within, we have eight. So we have here uh, 4.46 as our critical value. So critical value 4.46, 4.46. So, Okay, so now we basically, we have these calculations and now we're getting to this. So now we have the test statistic. So the test statistic is the same as with the p and group and all. So we have in sum of square total, which is basically the individual X minus the grand mean. We get the same thing with p and group and all. So if sum of squares between, that's basically the mean, the individual mean minus the grand mean. So that's the variation. Remember the, the society, the dictator game? That's basically the variation around the group. Then we have the sum of square subjects. That's the uh, mean of the participant minus the grand mean. So this is basically uh, all what we need. So if we bring this now over to the access spreadsheet, 
we're calculating now basically uh, so this is the calculation at step four so now we need to bring this in a little bit in a better shape and um, this is a little bit tricky so we're basically we're copying this now in this format you type and we need to bring this here and here make sure to get down here This is cheap here. So this is a little bit more involved with Excel, a little annoying. So you just need to aliquot this all the way. Okay. So now we need, first we need to calculate our grand mean. And that's simply done by calculating the average of all these entries, all these 15 entries. That's simple. Next we need, and that's a little bit more involved. So this is now our, our group mean, our N. And that is uh, the, the average of these five entries that represent the group but you need to lock them in to be able to pull them all the way down. So that's how that would look like. UFG, and 15, 15 And then I need to do the same here with 20. So that's basically how you calculate the group means, right? So the, the formula is quite simple. It's like, uh, it's basically just the average and that locked in. I'm putting it on putting it on here. So now we need a participant mean. So that's a little bit more annoying because that requires the calculation for each entry for each participant. So that's a little bit more involved. So you basically you need to do average of each participant. So you take the first participant comma, second participant, no, same participant. Uh, so you go through all three Bs. So that's a little bit more involved. So you basically, you need to lock this in again. So you do dollar K, dollar 10, dollar K, dollar 15, dollar K, dollar 20. Then you copy this one down and you change 10 to 11, 15 to 16, and 20 to 21. I know this is a little annoying, but it says. That's the same volume. Then you do uh, K12. That's subject three. K17, and then you do here 22. What am I missing? Oh, I'm in the wrong column. Okay, so of course it's J, not K. Okay. Always pay attention when you do this. Let's change. Let's do here. This is J. J thirteen. Eighteen. 
three. Then we do here 14, 19, 24. Let me copy this all the way down. So I'm just I'm copying the first formula down here. Okay. So this is now uh, the mean of the participant. And that basically gives you also an idea when you look at that variabilities between the participants within the group, there's a tremendous amount of variability. So this being said, uh, you know now that this can easily be calculated. Um, so you're doing x minus gm squared, x minus gm squared. That's basically uh, x. Oh. This is x minus gm squared. gm needs to be locked in because otherwise it shifts squared. That basically can then be brought all the way down there. Okay, so we have now uh, all these calculators. So now we have, uh, next we need m minus gm squared, which is now the m, uh, again parentheses, m minus gm, gm again locked in. Squared. So that basically gives you the sum of squares between. So again, so here we have, first we have uh, the total sum of squares, which is basically the difference between the individual scores minus the blind mean. So that's the, the total variability that you see in your data. That's the entire scalar, and you're basically subtracting the grand mean from that one constant. So you get an exact field of how much variability there is in your data. Next, you take the group means and you calculate those black bars from uh, black bars. Uh, you calculate this difference. So where's my, my favorite graph? So you basically you're calculating first, you calculate the sum of all these deviations from uh, the individual point to the grand mean. Secondly, you calculate those black errors now, which is basically giving you an idea of how much variability the groups Cost. And now, lastly, um, over there. Lastly, we're calculating the sum of square subject. So, m participant minus the grand mean. And that gives us an idea how much do the subjects differ from the grand mean. And the grand mean becomes your constant that basically never changes. But you basically, you, this, is, this becomes your reference point. This becomes your anchor point to quantify your variability. So if you do uh, M participant minus GM squared gets you now to M participant minus GM squared. Okay, so that's the difference now. That's your sum of square subjects. So now when you want to calculate the sum of squares, the calculation of the sum of squares is easy. So you do sum of squares between sum of squares, uh, no, sum of square total, and sum of square participant or subject. 
So you get a sum of squared plural three. That's basically the sum of all of these. A sum of squared of these and these. That gets Sum of squares for then is now total minus this, this, minus this, minus this. Now that is not correct, there's something off. What is off? Septic one, septic, ah. There's still a chain there. Okay. Okay, that's the right one. Okay, so as you can see, we have now the sum of squares double degrees five as a potential. Uh, and that brings me to my next question. So the sum of squares, you can divide the sum of squares by uh, the degrees of freedom and then square root that. That gets you to the standard deviation, right? So let's do a little bit of a thought experiment. So based on what you know about the standard deviation, so you know that an average has a unit, right? So if you have, if you calculate the average weight of a class and you collect the weight estimate or weight measurement of each individual in the class, you get them 20, 30 estimates. And that estimate, that average will have a unit. Right, so it's, if you have an average made of, let's say, 120 pounds, that average weight will be 120 pounds, so it has a unit. By definition, the unit is pounds. If you also calculate the standard deviation, what's the unit of the standard deviation? Hmm? Why? Okay, let's go through that. So if you calculate a deviation, right? So calculation of, uh, of let's go step by step to the calculation of a standard deviation. We have an individual score and we have a mean, right? Grand mean versus individual x, sum of square total. Um, so if x minus gm. So if I calculate the individual entry minus my mean, what unit is that? But let's do the classroom. So we have we have a weight estimate for each student, and we have an average weight of under twenty pounds. So it's the deviation. So the difference is in what unit? Pounds. It's still pounds, right? If I'm squaring this now, if, if I calculate this now and I square this for each student, now it's pounds squared. Exactly. If I'm summing this up and I calculate the sum of squares. What's the unit? Yeah. What's the unit of the sum of squares? Hmm? No. No. If you if, if you calculate the sum, it's still square. It's pound squared. If I'm calculating now the variance and I divide my sum of squares by the degrees of freedom. Now, but what's the unit of the variance? The variance is the square root. 
No, the variance is just the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So what's the unit of the variance? It's still squared, it's pound squared. If I am going now from the variance to the standard deviation and the square root of my variance, what's the unit of the standard deviation? Exactly. <laughs> so that's the million dollar question. So actually, when you when you think of a mean and the standard deviation, they, they both have the same unit. It doesn't cancel out. Same with the standard error of the mean, actually, just because you divide it, just because, and well, is, that is not true, actually. That is actually not true. The unit of the standard error of the mean is actually, ah, that's a good one. The mean of the standard error of the mean is actually not the pounds. Hmm? Square root of pounds. Because it's a square root of, uh, no, wrong, no, wrong, I'm wrong. Sorry, got it mixed up. Because it's standard deviation divided by square root of the n. It is still pounds. Standard error of the mean is always a pound. Yep, because it's standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. Yep. Okay, so let's start the experiment. Good, so we have now sum of squares total between subject and within. So that what we need next is we need to fill out our source table. So we basically, we have now uh, between, within, subject, and lastly total. We have sum of squares, we have degrees of freedom, we have variance, and we have F. So sum of square we know, sum of square between is 1092, sum of square within is 295, sum of square subject is 729, sum of square total is 2117. Degree of freedom is now, as we know, we found it up there. Degrees of freedom of two is between is two. Degree of freedom within is eight. Degree of freedom subject is four. And degree of to uh, no, degree of freedom of uh, total is the sum of all these. The variance is now calculated as sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom, right? Same it is for the degrees of freedom within, uh, the, the variance within the variance subject. If we're calculating on F, uh, the only difference now to, uh, to the calculation of between groups and over is that we are now suddenly, we're calculating between divided by within, that's 14.8. But we're also calculating uh, subject divided by within, which gives us an estimate for the F for the subject. What are we doing with this? In this context, in our simple context, nothing. So we are only focusing on this F. And this F is, as we can see, substantially different from our uh, critical value. Therefore, we are rejecting the null hypothesis. So we know now that these beers are indeed indicative of uh, uh, our beer rating is indicative of these groups being different. If we are now calculating R square, which is our next step, we're calculating our effect size, right? So this is basically the sum of squares between divided by the sum of square total. No, wrong. Total minus our subject. Because even for the calculation of our, our effect size, we're taking out the participant effect. 
that variance is being removed also from the from the estimation of the effect size. So now an R square of 0 0.78. So the R square basically ranges from zero to one. It's a proportion, nothing else. It's the proportion of how much of that effect of the difference or the variability of the difference of the individual group to the grand mean is called is 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 accounting accounted for in the total variability. So that basically puts a lot of weight on the between group differences and basically um, basically indicates that the groups are, are varying quite a bit from each other. So that's where the main part is. Okay. So that's uh, that's our R square. Good. So once we have done all of these calculations, we're basically calculating our variances that we have done, our Fs, and then we're making decisions. So we know our critical value is 4.46, our actual uh, F was 40.8. So we're rejecting it. We're calculating the effects as that we just did again. Sum of squares between as a proportion of the total sum of squares minus our subject's variability. Again, we can do a tucky on a significant difference test. So we know already how to do that. It's basically it's, uh, the mean of interest minus the mean of interest divided by the SM. So basically, it is calculated as easy as so we, we know already which one is different. So that's kind of obvious. We can just do a quick tucky. Um, So when we're doing tucky on a significant difference test, we're basically first calculating our SM. So that's basically the variance within divided by our N, which is 15. The whole thing square rooted. And those of you, uh, please remember, if, if you look at this, so this is basically the same calculation as a, as a standard error of the mean. It's the same thing because you're taking the variance, which is squared. That's why we come back to the units here. The variance is squared, so it's here rating score squared divided by an n, which is 15, just like the standard error of the mean is multiplied, and square root of it. It's the same as standard deviation divided by uh, square root of the n, comes to the same thing. Uh, so we have now our standard error of the mean, that's 1.57. We are interested in the difference, let's say the difference between cheap and so M, so now HSD, the Q is M1, M1 minus M3, because that's what we're really interested in, divided by our standard error of the mean. So that's uh, let's do this absolute. So if we're looking now at our Q table, which great, they didn't provide me this slide deck. So let's look at the Q table. We have here. Um, number of treatments, so the, the levels are three. Within groups, decrease of freedom is uh, four multiplied by two, that's eight. So we have 4.4 as our critical value for the Q with 11 exceeding our, uh, our Q. Ergo, we are rejecting the null hypothesis to have a significant difference between mean one and mean two. So that's our difference. All right. So that's this. Same we can do with a Bonferroni. So if we're having an F 
So we could do the formal hypothesis testing. Um, so if we are, well, we could quickly do that, but basically it is dividing. Oh, one second. Yeah, it's dividing basically the alpha level uh, by the number of comparisons for uh, three means that would actually be three comparisons. So we would basically only accept the research hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis if the p-value would be less than 1.7%. So uh, we're back to our within groups and over. Lastly, Nolan and Heinz want to speak about so-called weird samples, good reporting practices. So weird samples are basically samples of participants from countries that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. What does that mean? It means that uh, we are privileged to live in a privileged country and in a privileged society. Therefore, the differences we're seeing in our uh, in our studies and in our group comparisons do not necessarily apply to different parts of the world because there are inherent differences that are unaccounted for. So it basically goes in the direction of socioeconomic differences and uh, socioeconomic disparities will basically make some certain uh, comparisons not generalizable. Therefore, Nolan and Einstein ideas restating um, and call for including constraints on generality statements. That basically is a statement about target population that uh, generalization needs to be treated cautiously because they are uh, samples that come from Western educated, industrialist, rich, and democratic countries and may not apply to every region in the world, which is, I personally have never heard of uh, the term weird. Um, Obvious that the, the, the socioeconomic background, educational background, democratic, political background, that's kind of clear and that kind of goes without saying. And I think it's generally accepted in the research community and the scientific community to treat generalizable, uh, generalizability very cautiously. And therefore, it's in my world, epidemiology, it's uh, definitely called for the further reporting guidelines that will ask you to clearly report where are the samples from, from what time frame were the samples collected. So you're very transparent about these kind of things and to make sure that the interested reader can form his or her own opinion. And if we would be convinced that uh, the particular location of that region, the level of education of the general population or that particular population, the level of industrialization and wealth and, and political um, situation will play a role. We would declare that and discuss that in the uh, limitation section. So the STROBE guidelines, STROBE as well, all guidelines, all guidelines, STROBE, concert, Stark, they all ask essentially for a statement of generalizability where we, you would discuss these aspects. So the constraints on the constraints and generality statement would be something that would be found in there. So I guess it's kind of state of the art, but for you, it's just important to, as a take home message to know that it's important to convey the message that uh, not everything is generalizable that you see in your research. Good, any questions? Yes. Hmm? What is a two key? Uh, what is it? I just had a little bit. What do you use it to find? Uh, when do you use it? Yeah, but what do you use it to find? What do you use it for? It's a post hoc test. So what? Post hoc test. So you do first the ANOVA, you fill out the table. And once you have the source table completed, you get your F. If you're rejecting, uh, if you're rejecting the null hypothesis of the ANOVA and you find that uh, there is a significant difference in your ANOVA, you will resort to post hoc test. 
So there are two reasons why you would do a post hoc test, which can be either a Bonferroni or a Tucky. Um, so one is that there was a significant F score. Or secondly, you have a priori bound comparison, where you basically you 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 had um, two driving conditions that you were particularly interested. So it was like no driver, driver was co-driver, driving with cell phone, driving with video phone, and you were interested in only driving alone versus uh, video phone. And you have that already in your research question. You're only interested in that situation. Then you would compare these two. Exactly. So that would be the second reason why you do uh, postdoc testing. But basically, the drive for postdoc test is that you have a significant ANOVA. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, then have a nice evening. See you on Wednesday. Thank you. In here, so Thank you.